instead of ten. Oh, no, I said very gently. I wouldn't take a penny. I was glad to do it for you. Now, that was usually a wrangle over proper payments. I always came out the winner. My client's mouth fell open, and she stared at me pop-eyed. What did you say? I repeated my saintly remark. She jumped to her feet. You sick or something? She demanded, terrified. You coming down with something and me with three kids? No, I said. It's just that I've changed. She stared again, then put her hands to her head and staggered off to the bedroom. I heard the springs wail. Oh, God, she moaned. I'm starting to hear things now. She's scaring the heck out of the neighborhood, pretending to be a saint. You need to go back to the sinner's life. Scare the crap out of the neighbors like that? Lord. Lord. Okay. We just left. We're in the middle of what? Chapter 3. There, I was absolutely perfect. Chapter 3 or 4. Now I can't even tell. Hmm. Let's go flipping back through and find out what chapter I'm on. That's absolutely perfect. Chapter 3. All right, now she's just offered to, to do for free and has refused payment for doing um, all kinds of uh, dishes and things, three cases of beer and whatnot. She's scared the living crap out of the overweight, hungover uh, <laughs> neighbor woman by saying she just wanted to do it. So now she's starting to think she's hallucinating the neighbor woman here. <clears throat> I stole delicately out of the house. Tommy, one of the fat slobs, yelled to me from halfway up the telephone post. Yeah, you can't claim th climb this high. I climbed higher than you did Friday. Why would a fat slob want to go climbing the telephone pole? That's what I want to know. Of course, they didn't, didn't have any... Lord, I don't know if they even had electricity back in those days. If it was what? If she was 19, what? If she was 11 or 7? Or 1907? Seven years old, Easter Sunday. Okay. <clears throat> so it was 19... Yeah, 1907. Or maybe 1908, April. Yeah, it was 1908. <clears throat> Since how she was born so late in the year. <clears throat> Climbing telephone poles was absolutely forbidden, and naturally I always climbed them with remarkable agility, but not today. The pole was seductive, but I shook my head. I don't do those things anymore, Tommy, I said in my rich and uh, unctuous tones. And you shouldn't do them either. Your mother doesn't like it. You're just scared, said Tommy triumphantly. But with a high head, I went on to my next client, the boy's cat calls following me. On previous days, I'd have returned, pulled him down off that pole, and beaten him up. But not now. Ah, oh, not now. My next client was forbidden to me. I was never to speak to her, look at her, walk near her. I was only to ignore her. She was the neighborhood scandal. But she paid twice as much as my other clients, so I always sneaked in her back door to do her odd jobs for her. She was good for delicious slices of cake, too, and root beer, and she was exceedingly kind to children and actually liked them. She must have been the harlot. I did not know what made her so reprehensible, of course, but I had gathered from the whispers on porches that it had something to do with men, in capital, capitalized. Men, yeah, she's the harlot, all right. Well, Papa was a man, and there were men in all the houses, and there was nothing about them very menacing, and many things which were boring and dull. But I'd noticed that every man, including Papa, always sent a furtive glance at my client's porch, and if they saw her, they would give her a lurking smile, bend their heads, and scurry home to their colorless wives. I had come to the conclusion that my client was a scandal because she was beautiful and gay, that is, happy, not homo, sang like an angel, dressed like a dream, and laughed a great deal, and perhaps I was not too wrong at that. At any rate, my client was married. Ah, she was an adulteress. Her husband was a quick little salesman with apparently a good income, for he dressed natalie, carried a cane, and often had a rosebud in his label. Ah, that must have been her pimp then. Maybe she's a prostitute and he's pimping her out? Hmm. He also had an automobile, the only one for miles around. 
Because remember, this was 1900, not even in the tens yet. Not everybody had one. Uh, let me see. Now it's something, if you don't have one, it's like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you got a car? He traveled. He and I had one thing in common. We both adored his young wife. Sometimes when I worked for her, he was at home. He would sit in their small, gracious parlor just watching her, smiling and smiling. Occasionally, I would find her sitting in his lap, embracing him with ardor. Yeah, he's her sugar daddy is what he is. And the room perfumed with roses. It was a delightful vision, and it would give me joy to watch them. They were so young and happy, and they had an innocence which was beguiling to a seven-year-old girl who, according to Papa, was always up to one damn thing or another. <laughs> My client was alone at least five days and nights a week. Sometimes, late at night, when I had stolen from the house to sit on the steps of the porch while my parents snored upstairs, I would see a gentleman walk quickly and silently into my client's house. I'd see a light go on in the client's bedroom, and then it would go off again. I never saw any gentleman leave. This was of no interest to me at all. I never caught a glimpse of their faces, but I did observe they wore exceptionally fine clothes and that they often carried little boxes in their hands or a sheaf of flowers. I would forget them instantly and resume my happy contemplation of the night at peace because there was no one else around and I was alone under the moon and in the shadow of thick trees. Sleepy at last, I would steal quietly back into my house, say my prayers, and go to bed. On the day I was absolutely perfect, capitalized, my client was pleased to see me. Her rosy face was sparkly with dimples, and she appeared to be very happy. She wore a fascinating blue dress trimmed with lace. She wanted me to polish her parlor floor, which gleamed always like glass. But first, as it was a warm spring day, she insisted that I have a slice of apple pie and a cup of coffee. We never had any coffee in our house, being British, and my parents disdained this Yankee custom. Oh, but they'll drink that nasty tea mess that they always love to drink. Ugh, I'd take coffee any day of the week. The nasty, disgusted tea. Of course, I loved coffee. My client beamed at me while I ate an extra slice of pie. Are you all right, dear? She asked in her sweet voice, and she regarded me with solicitude. You look different somehow. Oh, I am, I assured her in my new rich tones. I've decided to be a saint. This joked at her. She stopped smiling and stared at me earnestly. Then she said, you'll miss a lot of fun that way. It was evident she had fun all the time. She was always in such a lyrical state. I'm not interested in fun anymore, I said. I was very grave. There are covenanters far back somewhere in my family, and they all spoke through me at once. My client was even more jolted. A little girl like you, she cried, aghast. Have your parents been beating you? According to my client, all children were rather sacred, and when punished by their exasperated parents, they were, in quotes, beaten. <clears throat> in the past, I had encouraged these misguided ideas of hers. They were good for cookies, a few chocolates, and an extra dime. Or once, happy day, a white little handkerchief dipped in perfume, which I kept with me for weeks until I lost it. But I could not let my client be deceived any longer. I only get strapped when I deserve it, I said righteously. My client was immediately depressed. She peeped at me uncertainly. Oh dear, she murmured. How melancholy. I wondered what I had said now that was making her look joyless and a little miserable. I've seen since then the exact expression on the faces of unfortunates being administered to so lovingly and eagerly by dedicated workers and uplifters. I went into her parlor, stuffed up to the ears with goodies, and began to polish her floor. I liked to do it. She was always so appreciative. She hovered in the doorway today, restlessly, as if full of uneasiness and doubt and disquiet. Any social worker knows that restlessness. They call it guilt feelings or loss of self-worth. My client wandered away. I finished up the job quickly, phrasing my words for rejection of payment. Then the door opened and a gentleman came in, all smiles and hope. Angie, he called. My client came running and rustling into the parlor. She looked at me and then paled. The gentleman saw me for the first time. What's that kid doing, Angie? He asked disagreeably. Oh, George, she exclaimed in distress. You shouldn't have come during the day. But Angie, I have something wonderful to tell you, and I can't come tonight, he protested, and he took her hand and led her away. They went upstairs murmuring. I had polished the floor. Now I dusted and wiped the fine little dressed and figurines of the cabinet. I did some more saintly work, not usually on my agenda. The back door opened and then closed, and my client came into the parlor. 
she stared she started when she saw me and i told her of the extra tasks i had done again she peeped at me then put her arm about my neck and kissed me here's 50 cents for you darling she said no i said calmly i was glad to do it for you i've changed i almost faltered 50 cents i ran from the house exultant that i was running from temptation then i saw charlie Charlie was a chunky, red-headed boy, mean as sin, a bully and a spoiled monster. He was two years older than I, and I hated him. I don't remember why children hate without adequate reason, but Charlie and I were sworn enemies, and we never saw each other without a boxing match. Papa, like most British men, believed that girls should be trained athletically, as well as boys, and among other things, he had taught me the manly art of self-defense. I was good at it. My fights with Charlie almost always ended in a draw, though he occasionally won, as I did. Upon seeing me now, he doubled up his fist, went into a crouch, and screamed, Put him up! I lusted for a fight with him. I licked my li lips, clenched my hands, and advanced. Then I remembered that I was now a saint. Go away, I said loftily, and dropped my own fist. I don't want to fight anymore. Charlie was stunned. You crazy or something, he demanded, incredulous. I scorned to answer, but did not scorn to watch him warily as I walked off. Let's see. She scorned to answer, but did not scorn to watch him warily. Oh, okay, so she is watching him anyway. She didn't trust him. But Charlie was too dazed to pursue or even utter another word. I had won another battle with self. This one didn't taste too good, but I reminded myself that I was now holy. I kept reminding myself all the way home. It was lunchtime, and Papa was already at the table. Well, he said a little surly, How much did you scrounge this time? You ought to be ashamed. I worked, but I didn't take a cent, I said, giving Mama an angelic smile, which made her step back hastily. Papa snorted. You mean you didn't work, he said. I sat down in silence, patient and long-suffering. Mama, extraordinarily quiet, pushed a lamb chop before me. This was always a signal for a howl from me, for I loathed the things. A lamb chop? I wouldn't expect them to have that back then. Uh, but I daintily took up my knife and fork and began to eat the chop. I pushed every nauseating morsel down my throat. My parents washed me. Mama's mashed potatoes were always full of lumps and tasted like cold starch, but I ate them, too, without protest. I even ate the infernal damp carrots. My parents were fascinated. Once or twice, they glanced at each other mutely. Well, said Mama at last in a faint voice, and she sank into a chair. Papa, shaking his head, went back to his studio. Don't worry, it ain't gonna last. <laughs> the day that she was absolutely perfect, there was only one day. Don't worry. I'll wheel Sonny around in his cart this afternoon, Mama, I said, after I've washed up the dishes. What's wrong, asked Mama, a little roughly. What's come over you today? What have you been up to? I worked, Mama, I said in a sugary voice. I paused. I had also disobeyed, Mama. I had worked for Angie. Ah, no matter. So I heroically told Mama. Her big eyes began to snap with fury. I told her about the gentleman and what he had said to my client. Mama's eyes stopped snapping. Mama hated gossip and never gossiped. She said so herself frequently. I naturally believed her. She leaned toward me and asked me quick little questions. Who was the man? Had I ever seen him before? What did that woman say to him? I was to repeat everything he had said and what she had said. I did. Mama was quite flushed. She even smiled a little. Then she remembered that I had disobeyed and she clipped me once, but absently as if thinking of something else. I rubbed my smarting cheek while Mama smiled faintly and somewhat maliciously. She became aware of me again. Oh, that creature, she said at last. If there were any decency among people, someone would tell her poor husband. This has gone too far in the day of all times. Has she no shame at all? I considered these remarks. I hadn't the slightest idea why my client should have any shame, but apparently it was expected of her. <laughs> it was also expected that her husband to be informed of the gentleman. Thinking these thoughts, I took my brother out in his carts after I'd washed the dishes. For some reason or other, and Mama was never a neighborhood visitor, she had gone to see the lady next door in great haste. Wheeling my brother was no fun. I would often relieve, relieve the monotony by giving the cart a hard shove down street, then race it to the corner where I'd grab the handlebars just in time to keep my darling little kinsman from hurtling over the curb and into the path of traffic. 
I'd begun the preliminary warm-up when I remembered once more that I was a saint, and saints did not endanger the lives of little brothers, no matter how detestable. They definitely did not race and show their drawers to the public. <laughs> I sauntered sedately with the cart and resolutely stifled my solid hate for small boys in general, and my brother in particular. Bored, I began to think again of Angie, who was such a scandal, and the gentleman, and again of my mother's remark. I became excited. I would do another good deed if Angie's husband returned that day. I wheeled Sonny's cart near her house and walked it up and down. I, do I doggedly paced, refusing an offer to play baseball and abandoned Sonny on some lawn, refusing other offers to go skating. See, it was safe to do that back then before we quit executing sickos who won't never live to get their hands on children. But anyway, before I get mad again, let's go on. Um, I was full of duty and thoughts and saintliness. I yawned while keeping an eye on Angie's house, and I even brought myself to wipe Sonny's little wet nose. I usually let him drip, and at this time of the year, he always dripped. Then, to my joy, I saw Angie's husband coming up the street, his eyes already bright with love and anticipation. I pushed the go-kart rapidly towards him and stopped him. He, like Angie, loved children, and he looked at me affectionately, and this was remarkable, as he was, I was not a very attractive child. I have something to tell you, I told him breathlessly, my heart swelling with goodness. Yeah, you're fixing to make a mistake. So I told him. He stopped smiling. He turned very white. His eyes looked sick. He kept wetting his mouth as he looked at me intently. Suddenly, he was not so young anymore. He sagged a little. I continued my story righteously. I told her the nightly visits of other gentlemen. Mama says it is scandal, I informed him. She called your wife that creature. Then he spoke very quietly. And before a child, too, he patted me on my holy head and went slowly, slowly up the street to his house. Where's the automobile today, I called after him. But he did not answer. His back was on the was the back of an old man. I don't know what happened after that. I heard only fragments of remarks from my mother and others, but Angie's husband was never seen again after that day. A few days later, a pallid and weeping Angie left after the furniture was taken out of the house and carted away. I was sorry to see her go as I watched at a distance. She was a scandal, Mama had said, but I had liked her so much. I had done a terrible mischief in all innocence and with only the most saintly of intentions. It was many years before I realized the fearful misery I had brought to two young people. Angie, Angie was doubtlessly a joyous sinner, but I had destroyed her husband's life and her own. She had been lovely and kind, and she really adored her husband, and in time, losing her first, youth, losing her first youthful excitement over living and coming to her senses, it is very possible that she would have reformed and devoted her later years to a large family of children. After all, tens of thousands of quieted Magdalenes sleep in the hearts of multitudes of good wives and mothers. 